um, for, I think, that, that are on the minds of a lot of people in the room in terms of uh, uh, how do we value our data? How, how do we assess it? How do we uh, uh, think about issues such as selection and um, perhaps even uh, re reduction of, of our digital collection? So I wanted to give you know, Chris and, and David an opportunity to kind of perhaps respond to, to some of those issues and, and perhaps that will kick start it. <laughs> Uh, we've, we've had this conversation before. Uh, I, I, uh, I drew a graph um, showing the, the effect of the um, IDC's projected 60% uh, a year compound growth in, in um, data and the 20% projected cost of 20% um, crider rate and the uh, 1% projected growth in IT budgets, which projected out that if, if this is true, then um, 10 years from now, storage is going to be consuming everyone's entire IT budgets without anything more processing it. Um, so I, I, we've, we've been bundled into a full sense of security by the very high crider rates in the past. And uh, storage going forward is going to be a lot less free than it used to be, and so we are going to have to take some tough decisions about what we decide to keep. And it's better to take those decisions up front than uh, run into the wall and then have to spend money uh, to get rid of data that you can no longer afford to store because you don't have the money. <laughs> So I think in terms of, um, I'll, I'll use one example in, in sort of our web wide crawling context. Um, we actually uh, went so far as to hire a body of um, interns, college students that were willing to go in and look at the highest, uh, most sort of data volume intensive resources that we were crawling um, to confirm which fell into certain categories of content versus others. Um, and we took the top, I think it was 20,000 resources. And we did that because there's some subset of content that ends up being um, mirrored in lots of corners of the web. Um, and we can get a representative sample of that type of material and, and what the web was like today from a, a researcher's perspective. But we don't need to have all of that from, from every resource. So we're trying to come up with innovative uh, methodologies to start to pare down um, and still have representative samples of everything that's out there that can be um, aggregated together, um, but not go uh, go so far as to suggest that we're um, covering everything at all depths and, and all breaths. Questions in the audience? <laughs> There is this uh, somewhat of a religious idea that uh, we need to keep the raw data all the time. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, now, you could always come up with a counterexample that if you filter the data in some way, then someday somebody will come up with uh, a question that you could not answer. And that becomes a kind of a fear. And because of that fear, we say that, OK, let's not worry about it. Let's just do the preserve the raw data, and then we can do the deep learning on it for whatever that we need. I think we have to somehow get away from that mindset uh, and start thinking about, given the type of data, what are the interesting kind of questions that one could possibly ask. Now, I know that's not uh, something that can be easily characterized, but we need to go in that direction and ask those types of questions, but has built some models as to how we can uh, perhaps capture, at least in a theoretical sense, that if we keep uh, maybe, say, 25% of the data in a particular way, then you can answer maybe 99% of the questions. And if you can get there, even approximately, I think it will be a huge progress. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I'd like to reinforce that. If you look at, at what the really high data rate uh, scientific experiments like the Large Hadron Collider or the Square Kilometer Array and so on, they do massive data reduction before they store anything. And that's for two reasons. One of them is they can't buy the storage bandwidth that they need, and the other is they can't afford to keep that stuff for long enough to be interesting. Um, and so in those fields, that's already uh, happening. It, it's much less easy to do that in the humanities because you don't, you don't have that depth of understanding of what the data really is. Uh, but at the same time, what we see um, this morning with the Crumb Crawl talk and, and what um, the Internet Archive is doing is that in the humanities, having a random sample of what's going on is often as useful and as, as having the whole thing and almost as useful. And this is actually the tradition with archival materials. Archivists normally uh, collect a few percent of the stuff that arrives in boxes. And we need to, to, to translate those techniques into the, the work that we're doing in the digital space because we, we, we're not going to be able to afford to keep everything. And there are no technological fixes for that on the horizon. So, so, so where would you, uh, where do you see the, the, the gaps in our sort of R&D knowledge? Like where, where would you like to see the field go in terms of uh, addressing some of these issues? It sounds like there's uh, some consensus here on, on the stage about um, thinking about uh, the ingestion of, of data up front, perhaps automating that ingestion, sort of conducting the selection at, at, at that early stage. Um, where, uh, you know, there's a whole room full of preservationists here, and, and where, where do you think that uh, that, that um, you know, some of those areas could be uh, examined and researched? Having worked for industry, I would say that you always start with the requirements. And if you can specify the requirements in terms of what kind of fidelity do you need, for example, or what are your requirements in terms of what is it that you want to preserve? And I suppose the answer is not that you want to preserve data, as I said earlier. The answer should be that you want to preserve something derived from the data, some, some sort of a knowledge. Can we specify that? And I don't think right now we have the mechanisms to really even talk about it in an intelligent way. But can we begin to talk about it, uh, about these requirements, have a language for expressing those requirements? And once we are there, then perhaps we can think about how do we take those requirements and then work backwards and come up with techniques which will be able to reduce the data and still preserve those requirements. I think um, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. I mean, Lisa pointed this out this morning that um, we're so focused on um, collecting and, and storing and, and preserving. Um, we don't always have the benefit of, of putting the compute capacity close to our storage and mining and analyzing at, at a machine scale that gives us insights into what else we might do differently. And I think many of us operate a little bit from a place of fear. Um, well, I better keep that because I have no idea when I'm going to be able to put it in a useful spot and somebody might do something amazing with it. Um, so I, I do think to the extent that we can invest in the discipline of data science as a, as a community um, and really foster the development of uh, that type of scholarship, um, make our archives available, if not within our own uh, four walls, but you know, outside of that, um, in context where researchers can have more interaction, I think we'll learn immense amounts about where we need to go from here um, and hopefully get out of the cycle of, well, we darn well better preserve everything because we don't know what we might want to do with it later. I think that's, that's a good place to, to end on. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank our presenters one last time, and I'm sure they're going to be around. <laughs> Can you find me or one of our presenters if you have further questions?